Welcome back to Beauty Marks Podcast, a space where we embrace our marks acquired through our journey. My name is Elizabeth Savion, and welcome to another episode of this podcast. I'm very excited to be um, partnering with High Hill Labs in downtown Orlando with this beautiful studio. And I felt like today was a branding color day where I wear my favorite color ever. Um, and I'm just excited to be here. And as well as today's conversation is a little different. And so I definitely want to give a trigger warning for sexual abuse and the topic that I will be talking about today. It is Sexual Assault Awareness Month. And so I felt like it was time to share part of my story. And to do that today with me, because girly knows I need some help, <laughs> it is a Sueli Rivera, which is my counselor. And I'm just so grateful for her to come on to support me in this and just being a little different today. Like she's actually going to be interviewing me about my story. So thank you so much, Sueli, for being here. How are you? Good, Elizabeth. Thank you so much for having me. It's truly an honor to be able to kind of help facilitate this and allow you to share your story and hopefully it'll impact other women um, who have similar stories who maybe haven't been able to give it a voice. Yeah, I literally was like pushing, trying to push this off for so long, so many years. And I'm like, okay, it's time. It will never be the perfect time. Um, but I definitely feel like nerves still start when you're about to share your story. You know, I am always about saying the power of sharing your story. And I'm like one that's always like, share your story. Your story matters. And I think this is another level of vulnerability that I'm bringing today. And it's just a different... Um, part of me that I feel like has been, um, you know, like kind of like in the back burner of like, I want to share, but just don't know when and how it will all work out. Um, but I so it definitely I know can bring a little tears and it doesn't mean that I'm not healed through it. And I know that that's a part of it. It's just part of like saying it and just talking through it, I feel like makes it more real, I guess. Maybe I don't know. So Ali's going to bring the therapist perspective <laughs> into this. Part of speaking, it, it it's, it's feeling that feeling of being exposed, right? So it's like, mm -hmm. wow, all of that um, is now out and open. And so um, one of the things that I love about your podcast is that you're, you really um, embrace vulnerability. And so this is this, it's almost taking that to the forefront and bringing your story and, and it, it brings that level of exposure. Like, wow, people are really going to know a little bit more about my story today. And so mm -hmm. I think it's normal what you're feeling. Um, I think, you know, if there's tears, I want you to embrace those tears. And if, and if you just power through and you're smiling and you're getting through it or, or no, or, or serious, whatever emotion, embrace it because that is part of your journey. It's part of the story. And so it's normal. All that you're feeling right now is normal. Yeah. Thank you. She's like my supportive <laughs> buddy today. Um, and also just letting you guys know, I laugh when I'm like nervous or like I get like a little bit like overwhelmed with or when I'm about to like cry, I laugh. It's it's my self-defense mechanism. <laughs> oh my so just so you know, if I talk about things like I'm kind of one of those and I think I've told Sully like that I laugh through my trauma, but that's like like so it's like I make humor of it. Like I go to comedy <laughs> instead of like seriousness. <laughs> so yeah so people are like you're talking about a really serious topic and why are you laughing I'm like it's not that it's funny it's just that that's like my body's reaction I guess of like nervousness or like uncomfortable feeling uncomfortable the way you learned how to cope when you have yeah. to have those difficult conversations I myself do the same thing I will start chuckling at times that I shouldn't be chuckling and so it, yeah it's not that it's not serious it's not that you're making light of your trauma or yeah. or this type of trauma it is just how you cope and so I'm glad that you mentioned that because it does happen exactly so in case someone's like is she okay <laughs> I'm fine it's just me um so Sueli you know I think this topic is something that a lot of people don't talk about especially in Latino culture and family dynamics and this is something that is usually happens like I would say more than we think it it does. And I feel like this is something that a lot of people either put under the rug or think that it's normal, like, oh, it happens to everybody, but look at them, they came out fine. Like people really minimize this. Um, and so I know for a long time, this has been something that I kind of would minimize even for myself. And so I feel like I'm finally like ready to talk about it. So we're gonna talk about it today. 
you hit a very good point. Um, oftentimes in our culture, we have kind of been, um, we're kind of taught, like we don't talk about family things. We don't talk about family secrets. And this is one of those areas. And so what I wanted to first ask you um, to kind of get this going was, um, maybe you can explain to your audience what happened to you as a child, what occurred so that they can kind of understand what your story is. So, um, at four years old, um, I've always, we've always lived with family in Miami. So I was born in Miami, um, moved around a lot. And so I am a middle child. My, I have an older sister and a younger sister and, at four on this day, my younger sister was being born, my other mini bestie. And so that day was the one night that my parents allowed us to spend the night. We're part of the Latino culture that we just don't spend the night, you know, like my parents are like, what's the point? You have a bed, you know. Um, so we stayed um, at a family member's house. And so that my mom was in labor, you know, all the excitement of, um, you know, having a new child come in, another girl, like we're a group of girls. So um, an exciting moment. But um, that night, unfortunately, um, I was molested and the um, by a family member while I was sleeping and um, I actually woke up to it and so there was some stuff that I think now I process and this was at four years old so now I see it very differently and I have gone through therapy but in the moment I think I was just like in shock of it um, and you know I it just was just a lot of just not knowing what was happening at the same time. Um, I guess context to that is that my sister was sleeping next to me when that happened. My older sister was sleeping next to me. Um, and so the next day I w wake up, you know, we're all just kind of prepping. My mom just had her baby or my little sister. And so we are all getting ready to go to back to the house to see, you know, the baby and everything. It was exciting. But um, I ended up telling a family member of something that happened to me and they were like okay so I had told my family member that someone had um done some sexual things to me and I and now I now thinking about it I don't even know the words that I can that a four-year-old can really use to explain that because when they say that kids you know, they have imagination. Like, I don't think it ever imagination goes to sexual things. But so I think that was the alarming part is the things that I, how I was able to say that at such a young age. Um, and so I pretty much told this family member, this family member was a little startled, asked my sister if something had happened to me at night. And she said, no, like I was sleeping, I don't know. And so then we go to my go back to see my mom and you know excitement of that and then my mom my parents are amazing and I feel like they have always created a space where you know they they're we're a close-knit family so we have always been the you know they've always been involved of like hey how are you feeling how are you doing you know like creating that space and where we feel open and so as um a little four-year-old girl um you know she's doing my hair um like probably this was like a day after we're all back at home and she's asking me how it went at this family member's house and she I ended up telling her um in the words of a four-year-old pretty much that someone did something to me um and she panicked she was like wait what like she was just so taken aback of what I was saying because that was something that you know, a four-year-old can't really describe or say. And so um, she's then like frantic, just going, looking for my sister and asking her about what I'm telling her. And they just like all panic. My mom, you know, like calls my dad and it just starts this whole kind of like, wait, what is happening? You know, and I was at that point, you know, like, I, Cause I'm one of those, I understand now, but like, I can remember things of my childhood. Like I, of that time, like a lot of people can't remember like their three, two year old, but in a way I can. So I remember that I was just like very confused. Like, did I say something wrong? Like what happened? You know, cause like my mom's just so like overwhelmed. I mean, she just had a baby. Like I can't even imagine like how, like something so exciting and then you literally find out that something also happened that's so heartbreaking. And 
you know, I think that that was just so hard to manage. So my mom um, calls my dad, tells him and says, like, this is what she's saying. Like, I just can't believe it. So they rushed me to the hospital to go get checked um, for someone that has been um, molested, sexually assaulted. They do a test. And so um, I remember I remember as a four year old and I still like the visual of like like it was like four nurses like in like mask and have everything. And they're like telling me to like open my legs and like, you know, like to check me. And I remember my mom was like holding my hand and like my dad's crying. I like I remember that like it was just so much like what is happening, you know, like and um, I think that that was something that I can't imagine like being on the other side and even though yes it happened to me but like I do feel for like my mom and my dad you know um because that's a lot of like emotions you know like how can you like um give a voice to like what just happened you know and so especially like you're a child you know so um my mom ends up I get checked and um pretty much they I remember they sent me to a room to be with someone to like draw a picture or something um and like to which I'm guessing was like a therapist or someone you know social worker or therapist and they were probably wanting to see if you could kind of through drawing because of the age your age they wanted to understand from your perspective what happened and probably what areas of your body Mm -hmm. and, and that type of thing so that's very common on how they they do it with children do remember that during that time um there was some charges pressed against this person um and so my parents really were like the dude they did the due diligence of going like absolutely not this is you know how can a four-year-old and I remember her saying like how can a four-year-old like explain that like of what just happened like no one can they can't imagine that and I'm so thankful for my mom for believing in me and I just want to say that like you know because I know my mom was probably watching this but like I know so many kids that experience these things and like nobody believes them. And I have to say that my mom has always believed me. She always like defended and she always like fought for like that to never happen again, you know. And so I just want to say thank you, mom, because I know that like there are kids that have told their parents or their loved ones and they never were given that space, you know. So um After that, um, we they pressed charges against this person, but there was a lot of dysfunction in my family dynamics that they ended up sending this person that abused me to another country to flee from the consequences of their actions. And this caused a lot of division. There was a lot of manipulation, gaslighting. There was like, no, that's a lie. Like, how could this person do this? Like, absolutely not. There's no proof. Um, There's no like you know, there's all these excuses, you know, and that are made. And and honestly, the image of what people do in these situations, they want to protect the family name. They want to protect the family versus the the survivor of someone that has just gone through this. Um, And so um, fast forward, I've said this before, but I moved around a lot growing up. But the main reason why we moved from Miami was to get away from this dysfunctional family dynamic. And um, so really, my parents really decided, like, we need to get out of here. This is not a safe place. There's not safe people here. And so literally, we went to the middle of Oklahoma. And uh, I remember being like, there was a lot of confusion because my parents, we were young. So like I was four, I was six at this point. My older sister was um, nine and then my younger sister was two. So we were all very young, you know? And so we're all just like, okay, family road trip. You know, we don't know, but like we're pretty much leaving our whole family and starting a whole new life in another state, you know? But the real reason why that happened was because of what happened to me. Um, so they wanted to protect us and they wanted to like you know take care of us because they felt like that was impossible in the dynamics we were in you know there was a lot of um family attachments which were unhealthy and just some dynamics that didn't allow for a safe space and so we pretty much move over there start this whole new life and um kind of in a way try to forget like what happened so with that you know First, let me say kudos to your parents for 
making the decision to to take you know you guys as a family mm -hmm. away from that dysfunction because so many families don't they will stay living in it they'll know mm -hmm. about it and sometimes allow things to even reoccur mm -hmm. um to protect the family versus to protect the child and so I want to commend your parents for that because it is a difficult thing because, you know, our culture is very family oriented. So I know it's a difficult thing to leave what you know and everyone you know to start fresh, but I commend them because it gives an opportunity for that. But I caught what you just said in that last moment where it was kind of like we didn't really talk about it. So what happened after, after you moved, when you say you didn't talk about it, what was... How did that affect you or what were the things that you noticed took place after everything happened? Now I realize when I was younger, I would always be scared of the night, like of the dark, of the nighttime. I remember after the abuse happened, those prior two years, um, my parents took me to a few therapy, um, child therapy, but like it was kind of like, OK, she's fine. You know what I mean? Like she's kind of like it's all good. You know, um, they would tell my parents that like, you know, well, child that have been sexually abused, they um, either are, are very introverted. They're very like to themselves. They're very like sad. Like they're very. So they had like this, like, OK, like but my daughter's very outgoing. She's like really good in school. She's good around people. So I feel like they which I understand at the end of the day, it was the education and the the capacity that they understood. Um, it was kind of put as like she's fine and like God is going to heal her and God's going to restore her and like we're going to pray about it. And so when I would have like nightmares at night, I remember it was like from this was from four. It started when I was four after the abuse. Now I correlate it that it was because I was abused at night that I feared the night. Like I would always feel like someone was going to come and take me or someone was going to do something to me or I was going to be harmed. I hate like I felt like I was seeing things like I was very, very traumatized, but like it wasn't put under that category. PTSD like symptoms because you're having that fear there, there this hypervigilance of someone coming into the room. So, yeah, that's very common after sexual trauma. Yeah. And um, I had to sleep with my mom for a really long time. Um, I would have to then be like put me with my sister to sleep. So like I was never like alone at night. Um, I would always have a nightlight and they always thought it was kind of like, okay, let's pray. So I remember, I remember when I was like, probably this was five, they brought like a pastor to pray like over my room, over the house. Cause he's like, maybe there's like a demonic spirit or there's like something in here. Like, you know, and I remember that that's what they were told that maybe then it's spiritual and maybe it's something that she's going to like, maybe that's a spiritual attack over her life, but not correlating to the trauma that I had just gone through. Um, so I would be scared of the night, would hate the night. And even till this day, like as 27 years old, um, I don't like the night. Like it's just something that I don't feel really comfortable with. And I've healed through a lot of parts, but it's still something that I just like, you know, I remember there was a time in, in my teenage, even adulthood that I would be like, I just wish we can skip the night, like, and we can just get to the morning. Like it was just always like, Ugh, like I just hate the the experience of like falling asleep because I feel like defenseless to like whatever can happen. You know, I was always like I remember, oh, putting like scissors under my pillow and like putting things around me as like a way of like someone tried to sneak in or someone tried to do something. I would like protect myself. I actually hear the trauma. Right. And so going back to those child therapists, um, they're not wrong that some kids, this is how it shows up, but no two kids are the same. There are some kids that will be, become hypersexual. Some children mm -hmm. will act out in anger. Some kids will even show like ADHD symptoms, mm -hmm. like the can't focus, they can't concentrate. So every child um, can sh uh, demonstrate their trauma differently. Mm -hmm. And so they'll, we know the power of prayer and, and, you know, I'm huge on mm -hmm. prayer, but at that time, it, you know, it definitely is one of those times where there, that was your trauma speaking because the moment you said it happened that night and these, the, these moments were at night and I need to sleep with my sister or with my parents. It was just your body is kind of reliving the trauma. Like night isn't safe for this little person. Mm -hmm. So we talk about how we see how it affected you as a child. How do you see it affect you or how did you see it affect you as an adult? Let me start in like middle school, high school. I definitely feel like I wasn't 
hypersexual. Um, I was more the opposite. I was kind of scared. I remember being called a prude because all my friends would be like making out with all these guys and like doing stuff. And I would be like, ugh, like, no, like it would just my fight or flight would come on. Like I didn't feel safe people touching me like like even to this day, I'm not a physical touch person. It takes me some time to like warm up and feel comfortable around people and especially men, um, to be honest. And so I think it's just been like a process of seeing how that made me feel like more like, oh, no, like I don't want that. When sexual songs would come on, when I would see people kissing, it just made me feel something inside. Like I was like, oh, like I just feel so uncomfortable. Um, and I think that what I realize now is also that that really affected how I saw men. And like I also felt like my no was being taken advantage of so like when I did start dating I started going towards guys that wouldn't respect my boundaries and like didn't see me as like a value and like didn't like didn't say like when I would say no it'd be like well like come on like so I kind of feel like I had to like okay well like I'll do you know I did um I did lose my virginity, you know, when I was young. And so it was something that I felt also, though, was taken advantage of. It wasn't something that I fully chose. It was that I felt like I should, like, I didn't have a no. Like, I was like, well, like, you know, I should do this because, like, you know, like, they, you know, they are, like, consistent. They're persistent instead of being like, no, like, I don't want to do it. And, like, I, you know what I mean? So I felt like I lost my no as a young child. And I feel like throughout being a in middle school high school and even till adulthood it's been more of like trying to find my boundaries and like trying to like find my voice again because I feel like I lost it because of what happened to me um how did it affect relationships that you've had I was definitely a yes person always I was always trying to please people everybody else like I would always like put them before me um I would always want to be liked or like especially in romantic relationships, I like felt like I was always trying to like win their affection or their love or, you know, whatever the case may be, because I felt like there was something wrong with me. Um, I think now I see how I felt a lot of shame from what happened because we moved to a whole nother state because of what happened to me. And I felt like it was like I started blaming myself like, man, like if this wouldn't have happened subconsciously because we didn't talk about it but it was subconsciously I feel like I see how I started kind of pinpointing to myself or when I would get in relationships I do remember telling my middle school I think it was my middle school boyfriend or high school that I was abused and I remember telling him that because he you know like you get those questions in high school like oh like what have you done you know and I was like I just don't really feel comfortable like you know and I remember telling this person and he's like oh wow like that's like serious and I remember feeling like oh I'm like tainted like something has already happened to me like I'm bringing like baggage in you know like I'm bringing something and so I feel like that played out in me trying like when I would see someone that hadn't been through abuse and like they were a virgin or they were clean or pure you know like I would be like oh I'm already like tainted like like they already are above me you know because like they haven't been through that and like I'm bringing this trauma that I don't know how to explain either it's how when trauma happens and and you know after the aftermath of trauma right that's how sometimes core beliefs are created because we will begin to believe these stories the, these things mm -hmm. these narratives that we're telling ourselves right um that you know i'm tainted the, what you were just saying mm -hmm. is a perfect example of how that starts becoming our our truth at that moment mm -hmm. and we start believing it and then we start walking that out and so that's why when you said i struggled with my yes that's a perfect example of okay now this belief is what we call sometimes whether a core belief or an automatic thought that we have um we take that and we now walk this out as if it's truth when the reality it's not um and so it, it, it's a challenge. Well, okay. I know that you have been doing work with, with me, but also I know that you had another amazing counselor as well. Um, can you kind of walk us through what it's looked like walking through your healing? I mean, I didn't deal with at least my child's abuse until I was actually 19, 20 years old. Um, so what happened was that, you know, like, things resurface when you don't deal with them. And I feel like that is really a part of my story because, 
even though I was doing really good in school, straight A student was very like outwardly, I was doing so good, right? So like nothing was wrong with me. So we just didn't talk about it. Like Liz doesn't struggle with anything. Like, okay, what happened in the past? Like it doesn't go with today. My parents didn't know though all the other struggles that I had and they didn't correlate that to that. Um, and until I remember when we were, even though we were secluded and we kind of we're over there. Um, I remember when we would come back to Miami or visit, um, this family member would be at the parties that abused me and, you know, kind of like back to normal, back to regular programming. They brought this person back, you know, and they never got consequences for what happened. People didn't believe what happened. So they said, you know, that wouldn't that there was no proof, you know, look at her now, look, look, she's succeeding. Like there's nothing wrong with her. Um, and so until this per family member was always in parties and everything, I started feeling it in my body again. And I remember feeling so uncomfortable. I started feeling like, like just so anxious about like this person um, being around. And then I was like the only one that really felt that way. So I remember being like, is this normal? But like, we haven't talked about it. So like, I guess we're, it's okay, you know? So I feel like I was taught through not talking about it that we just kind of overcome things by not talking about it and not like confronting things. Um, and so until this person started going, I remember they gave me a gift on my 18th birthday when I graduated and I got this card and this like gift card and I open it and I'm like, this is just so weird. Like, this is so uncomfortable. Like, I remember feeling like, how is this normal? Like, how are we normalizing this? But like, I didn't want to bring it up to my parents because I felt uncomfortable and I didn't want to like bring it up again because we hadn't talked about this for years. This was like 15 years. So when this person is starting to show up, I start feeling these things in my body and I finally tell my sisters about it and I'm like hey I just I don't know like I feel a little uncomfortable like I start kind of like processing it out loud and I'm like this is weird right like why is this person here like and I remember there was a day that this person was going to stay at my house um and that was kind of like the tipping point because I remember I went to my room and I'm like an adult like one adult I was like 19 20 um, and this person was going to stay at my house. And I remember that I locked my door. I put like a chair towards the door and I was like crying. And I felt like the four year old little girl. I can understand. Right. Yeah. Because the somatic is very part of the sexual trauma that people experience is remembering things in their body so they can feel things they can. And so, number one the fact that you were able to be open with your sisters, like, I'm so glad that you did have that outlet. But mm -hmm. even that what you're describing there, you it's almost like reliving it. And so it's, that's where we kind of kick into that almost like PTSD, where, yeah. okay, I'm reliving, I'm literally my four year old self reliving this again. And so um, what did you do? Um, after that visit so after that time I remember telling my sisters like I don't feel comfortable him being here and I don't and I talked to a few people that had known of what had happened and I was like I just feel like this is so uncomfortable I need to talk to my parents and I remember um I actually started going to therapy um I signed up to go to therapy with Maria I love her um and um started kind of working through that so like I felt like I needed to say something but I didn't know how and so Someone connected me. I don't remember who, but someone connected me to start going to therapy. So I actually started going to therapy initially just for my child abuse for the first time in my life. Never had gone to really talk to someone. Was so foreign. Was the first one in the family to really do it. So um, I went and they're like, OK, well, like because of what you went through, like, yeah, it makes sense. Like you go to like work through that, you know. But coming really what that really did it was completely like heal and free me in so many ways because I started seeing things that were very dysfunctional. My counselor was like, you know, I think you need to write a letter to your abuser and kind of like kind of like heal through that. And I worked through like forgiveness and I worked through so many things during that time of like me just processing for the first time what really happened and I feel like I was finally given the space to do that and someone to validate what really happened. And I remember something that I would always do is that I would be like, well, like I wasn't like 
raped to this extreme. I wasn't, this didn't happen to me as bad or like, well, it only happened this time. So I would always minimize like what had happened to me. Um, and I would always be like, oh, I don't want to seem like a victim, you know, like, oh, I don't want to seem. And so that stopped me from healing for so long because I didn't give a voice to the four year old. I didn't give a voice to myself and validate what I really had gone through, which did Im impact me in so many ways um, through adulthood. Um, and so for the first time working through that and I finally through therapy, I built up the courage to finally talk to my parents and I finally told them like, that was the most awkwardest conversation I remember because it was like there like I was like okay like how do I bring this up like sitting like okay like how do I because like we don't talk about it so it's just like everybody knows that it happened but like nobody brings it up so I finally um told them I don't feel comfortable I was trying to that was the first time actually setting my boundaries I said I don't feel comfortable this person coming to the house I don't feel safe and if this person's coming I'm not going to stay here at that point, I was like 20, 21, probably. Um, and I was like, I don't feel comfortable with this. This makes me feel uncomfortable. I don't understand it. Why is this person even around us? And they finally, for the first time, really like allowed to like say, you're right. I don't understand why this person is here. Because there was a lot of unhealthy manipulation that was done to my parents really of trying to normalize it of like oh well I've this is this is family like we you know we work through things like if you're a Christian like I don't know why you're like trying to separate yourself like you know and so that really like held my family so like into this little cycle because we had been put as like you know as a Christian you need to like allow things and forgive people and like you know, you just need to be so kind and so nice no matter what people do to you, you know? And so finally I was given that space where my parents really were like, yeah, you're right. We're going to tell them that they can't come and bring this person to the house. And I was like, okay. <laughs> Which took so much though, because I feel like when you've never given yourself a voice or really worked through some things, it's so hard to like validate your own self because you're like, should I even be saying anything like and then also like what if I say something and like nothing happens or like they don't validate it or they make it, it gets worse because sometimes it does get worse. You saying and you actually like telling your story and you saying, hey, this actually isn't OK. You can lose family members, family members that till this day don't believe that what happened to me happened to me. And they think that me bringing it up 15, 20 years later is me trying to cause drama or division in the family. Listen, I want you to know that you being able to put to speak about this, even now as an adult, is giving a voice to that four-year-old self, your 13-year-old self, your 18, 19-year-old self. It's giving a voice to your truth. And that is so important. You know what? There's this misconception that because we're family or because we're Christians, we have to just keep this, keep certain things and, um, around us and be okay with it. And that's not true. That's, that's not biblical. Mm -hmm. um, and so honestly, the fact that your parents were open to listen, open to receive, it's true what you said, not every parent does that, not every situation is the same, but in yours, you had family that was supportive. You had your sisters, you had your parents. And so having these boundaries, these boundaries are healthy. Mm -hmm. um, Part of the, the issue that we see in, in our culture period is we kind of condone things because of the labels of family or Christian. And we have to be careful with it because it's stripping the voice of the person who actually has survived this abuse. Mm -hmm. And so honestly, I commend you guys because you really have tried your, you know, tried to do the best that you can with what you guys knew. But mm -hmm. as you went to therapy, what I loved is you brought in your knowledge into your family, started setting boundaries, started sharing these things with them. And then it gave your family, it sounds like a different perspective on things and allow them to also kind of shift as well. Now that you are sharing your story and, and are able to talk about it more, what are some things that you are consciously doing for yourself in regards to um, your boundaries? With this family member, I definitely feel like once the boundaries were placed, it like shifted everything. And sometimes we think that by not saying something, we make it better. But really, sometimes we make it worse for ourselves because we're we're having internal chaos when we don't say what we really need. And so I feel like that was the start of 
kind of like this person limiting access to being able to come. Like if I was there, this person was not allowed to be there. And so that started shifting the dynamic. And I remember there was a lot of things that this person wanted to talk to me. And I just felt like, I'm like, I don't need that. You know, I wrote a letter, I forgave, I healed through it. And it's taken years, like really to really deal with that. And I remember even through our therapy sessions today, how one thing correlates with something else, like the present day, like stuff that you experience in childhood and in teenage years and even adult relationships like still trickle down to the way that we act the way that we see ourselves and so I feel like actively staying with my boundary helped and like educating myself on like wow like invalidating myself of like wow that's why I see myself that way that's why this happened that's why this um so I feel like that has empowered me to really like finally find my voice and like feel more like whole within myself of healing because that journey of healing was really me doing that and it wasn't because people were validating at the point or like yeah like you work through that like healing was so hard and it brought up so many emotions and I remember being like wow like this is stuff that I wish I would have known when I was younger because I feel like it would have helped me so much. And so now being able to share it, I feel like it's so freeing because it really doesn't have power over me or hold on anything. And I like probably a few months ago, we had like a heart to heart in my family, like where we really brought together how trauma really affects everybody. And as a family, it has affected each and every one of us of a lot of shame, of a lot of guilt, of a lot of regret, of a lot of just pain, of like a lot of just stuffing your feelings, which because in my family dynamics, they didn't tell anybody. So for all these years, nobody knew the reason why we had moved, the reason why we had isolated ourselves from a lot of people. And it's kind of like, finally getting to the place where we're healing within the family of my own immediate family to see how it affected everybody, how it affected my mom, my dad, my sister, my younger sister, because my parents ended up, because they were so overwhelmed, they didn't have the support. They felt like they started sheltering us and like trying to protect us. Like I wasn't allowed to spend the night anywhere. I wasn't allowed to go to things like because they were so fearful of it happening again, you know? And so I feel like it started a reaction of like us creating a space within our own immediate family where we can talk about these things. And it hasn't been easy. I'm not going to lie. It hasn't been easy. There's been a lot of just because we're all we're all individuals with our own personal trauma. And then when you bring trauma into the mix with something else, it brings it resurfaces some other things. And some people aren't ready to deal with certain things. And so it's been a lot of us forgiving and working through and and even with my mom I remember having like telling her like mom like I forgive you if you think that I'm holding something like I don't hold anything against you and like I want to release you from that like you couldn't have done anything different like by the grace of God I'm here I'm healthy like I've been able yeah like it was such like a beautiful moment um with my mom and my dad and I told him I was like I forgive you and I don't hold it wasn't your fault and like I want to free you from that shame that you have because like in some way shape or form like what happened to me like I luckily was able to say what happened to like literally like two days after it happened to some to my mom and you guys like just it trickled down to everything you know and like by the grace of god i'm here i'm healthy i'm good i'm i'm i was able to get help through therapy and that like transformed my life in so many ways and like yes i've hit some bumps in the road but like ultimately like i'm so grateful for my story you know because like god has used it you know so he's used it he's used it in such a beautiful way because now look you have this amazing podcast where you bring on so much information and knowledge about different topics trauma dating all of these areas and because of what you experienced you know god has utilized this as a way for you to have this platform now to help other people and share your story and even taking the moment of telling your parents like I know this wasn't your fault. Like I, you know, freeing them because as parents, you know, as a mom, you do that mom guilt is real. Right. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And so it's so 
I can imagine and to hear those words, you know, it is freeing because it's taking away their own guilt or shame or, or emotions that they're feeling. But mm -hmm. it sounds like through all of this, you have really um, acquired a lot of um, a lot of healthy um, coping skills because I hear the boundaries. I hear those things. You're, you're speaking up for yourself. You're advocating for yourself now. Um, but are there any other lessons that you've learned as you've been, heal you know, walking out this healing of this trauma? Yeah, I think for sure that it's not linear and that it's sometimes we're very hard on ourselves because we either think that it's going to be like, OK, like I'm in therapy. I'm very much like that. And I'm God is still working. But I'm like, OK, here's the plan. I'm going to do one, two, three. And I'm going to be so good. And that's not how it works. <laughs> I know she's like um because I'm very much like that and I'm like god why did you like my brain the way that it works like you know and so I just feel like I know I've been very intentional with my healing but there are still days that I remember things and there are still days that things come up like when special family occasions come up like my sister's wedding there's stuff emotions coming up you know and that's I want to normalize that like it doesn't just go away um you might be still faced with certain people that still tell you till this day that they don't believe what happened to you or they don't um they don't believe you or they don't like just give you the space to be open you know for it and that's okay you know and I feel like it's like you understanding your story you understanding your trauma story is so important because then you're able to heal for you and for ultimately what God wants to heal and restore inside of you like there's a part um that I feel like God does take everything that we go through and turn it into beautiful things, you know, and he um, and I feel like trusting and leaning on him because I know that that's ultimately my real how I've even got through here to protect me through so many things that I've, I've gone through because of the vulnerabilities that I had because of what happened. Like I can see how like God protected me. God like was there. God br brought people into my life to be like I know that no one else is helping you here, but I'm going to put this person to help you or to like protect you or to help, you know, to guide you through. Um, so I just feel like I just want to remind someone that like you're what happened to you was first not your fault. And it, like, don't believe the lies of the enemy of like shame and guilt and just feeling like that you're not pure or, you know, those are all lies like. And I just want to validate that what happened to you, no matter on the scale of sexual abuse it's still valid and it's still real. And um, I just want you to know that you're not alone in it and that you can heal and you can have a beautiful story, even after trauma, even after stuff that hurts us, you know? And I just, you know, want to give space to that like four-year-old girl that I know that if I was to look back at her, I would be like, you're going to be okay. Like, you know, you're going to get through this and you're going to like be so proud of the, what you've created today you know that's so beautiful what you just said there you're giving space to your to go back and tell your four-year-old self like hey I know this was rough I know this but you know what this is where we're at today and even though there are moments of feeling triggered because it's true mm -hmm. I think a lot of times when there's trauma we often believe like okay well we we went to therapy we <laughs> did that we prayed about it we're good mm -hmm. right but we don't realize that different things, different seasons or, or different um, stages of our life will bring up sometimes a different, uh, a different memory or bring up some of those, those same feelings that we had. And mm -hmm. so we work through them. And, and, and I think what you said was so important for everyone that's listening is that this is their, if that's your truth, no one can take your truth away from you. Um, don't allow anyone to make you feel that you have to keep this um, so hidden that it internally is creating this chaos inside of you. You have a voice and you have the ability to work through it and heal. And that is the best gift you can give yourself, mm -hmm. you know, is that opportunity to free yourself from these big emotions, from these memories that can sometimes torment us. And mm -hmm. so I want to commend you, Elizabeth, because you telling your story today, I know without a doubt, God is going to utilize that and not only utilize that here, but on your, this platform, it's going to be someone needs to hear this. Someone needs to hear like it's OK to 
to walk out a healing journey right now. It's okay for them to face something that maybe they were told they couldn't talk about or didn't, or were told that it didn't really happen when it did. And so you allowing yourself to be vulnerable and share this way is giving someone else that space today to go, Mm -hmm. wait, if Elizabeth can do this, you know what, I can walk this out so that they can gain their voice back. So I am so proud of you, girl, because you did it. Thank (laughs) you. Ooh, with some tears and some tissue. <laughs> Embracing. We cry here on Beauty Marks podcast sometimes. <laughs> I know. No, I definitely want to say that I'm so grateful for you. And like, I want you guys to know that like why I'm so passionate about therapy and like counsel is because of people like Swelly Maria that have literally transformed my life in such a way to help me heal the inward areas that I felt like were so like, this is how I'm going to always be or like, man, it's going to be so hard, but it's like people can walk you and people care and like people want to help you work and see you flourish, you know? And so um, I know no matter how long it's been still say it, you know, and still find healing through that, even if it's for you and for your future generations, because to be honest, I sometimes fear having kids like and I know that that's part of my trauma is that I fear that something's going to happen to them or someone's going to get abused and so that's been part of my healing too to be like no it ends with us like we're creating a culture of educating and healing through so that it's not going to be something that happens in every family um so thank you Swelly for for this space and creating the space so thankful that you did this because I truly believe that you're going to touch someone's life with your story and that is going to give them the opportunity to to now move into um their healing the their part of their healing I appreciate it and any resources that you have for someone that has been abused or that needs to talk to someone obviously my first thing I always tell people go to therapists there are trauma therapists who specialize in working in trauma especially sexual trauma it's an an area that a lot of um a lot of us really hone in on, we, we take certifications in addition to our education. So you can go on to psychology today and find a therapist in your area um, who specializes in trauma and who can walk this out with you. Also, maybe you're listening, maybe you know someone that ha- you've experienced a recent sexual assault. I do want to give the National Sexual Assault Hotline number, which is 1-800-656- 4673. Um, You can reach out there. There's so many different resources, um, including NAMI, um, or you can reach out to a local therapist and we can provide. And I don't even want to discount, there are so many pastors that have resources now um, to help, um, whether they have counseling centers um, in their 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 churches or they're um, connected to therapists. So you can even talk to your pastor um, of who you could go to to help walk you out this this in the season of your healing thank you thank you so much and i will put all the information down below i kind of want to wrap up with a prayer for someone that maybe is listening and it's like because i know it's triggering and i know that maybe it's bringing up things for you so i just want to close out with a prayer so father god i just thank you for this moment father god in this time that you've given us father god to really tell my story father god but ultimately it's part of your story father god thank you for your protection and just for allowing us father god to speak to someone's heart today father god that maybe needs that courage or that peace or that strength during to finally say something father god to finally set the boundary or to get help that they need father god i just pray father god that you may remind them how loved how just cherished and how you want to help them to heal father god and that you have such a beautiful story for them after what they've just experienced father god i just ask for your protection in jesus name i pray amen Thank you guys so much for tuning into this week's podcast episode. I know it was a little emotional. Definitely needed the the tissues. Thank you, Carlos. And I appreciate um, you guys listening. And I I really hope to just bring awareness and just to validate that you're not alone in this. And just to remind you of how you can literally build such a great life even after anything that you have experienced and through God, through therapy, through just community and support. And um, I hope that you share it with a friend and share this encouraging message and I will see you guys next week.